Welcome to our 2017 webinar, Putting People at the Center, the Role of Lived Experience in, in Dismantling Collateral Consequences Caused by Incarceration. My name is Quentin Williams, and I'm with Heartland Alliance's National Initiatives on Poverty and Economic Opportunity. On behalf of National Initiatives and our presenters, we are very pleased um, that you are joining us today. So today we have some excellent speakers. Today we have Marlon Chamberlain, who is a force organizer and Rocky Coalition leader. We have Michelle Rodriguez, a senior staff attorney at the National Employment Law Project. And we have Glenn Martin, president and founder of Just Leadership USA. And myself, um, again, as I said, I'm a workforce research and policy fellow at Heartland Alliance. Uh, before we begin, a few housekeeping points. Um, everyone listening to the webinar is muted. You can use the chat box on your control panel as pictured here on the slide to send a few questions for panelists at any point during the webinar. Now, how we'll do that, we will receive them and direct them to the appropriate presenter to answer during our Q&A session. Um, you can type questions into the chat box at any time. The Q&A will happen at the end of the webinar. Um, if there are any questions that we don't get to, we will try to answer them via email afterwards. The slides and recordings will be available on our website after today's webinar as well. And finally, we'll be using the hashtag, capital L, capital E, in policy. That's L-E for lived experience. So please join us in tweeting about the webinar and please uh, use our hashtag. So, so like I mentioned before, we have a great group of speakers today, and I'll be handing it off to them shortly so that they can tell us more about their models of inclusion in their policymaking efforts, specifically how including people that are often on the margins of policymaking actually makes for better policy. But first, here's some introductory material about us. Um, Heartland Alliance's National Initiatives on Poverty and Economic Opportunity were dedicated to ending chronic unemployment and poverty and work at the intersection of practice, policy, and research to set in motion change that is practical, informed by evidence, and grounded in the experiences of providers and advocates across the country. A few of our initiatives include the National Transitional Jobs Network and the National Center on Employment and homelessness, which houses our Connections Project works, which was highlighted in recent webinars. I would like to add that one of Heartland Alliance's core commitments um, identified in our latest strategic vision is to, quote, partner with participants and others to co-create and achieve ambitious shared goals. As part of acting on these goals, at our most recent conference, we convened the session on the role of lived experience in policymaking, where we had advocates, many who were formerly incarcerated, including myself, who spoke about what we bring to the table when it comes to policymaking. In many ways, this webinar was birthed out of that session, and we hope to build on our learnings today as well. To get us going, I'll give a short introduction um, and, and set up our wonderful presenters, um, and then I will hand it off to them. But first, just a couple of things. Um, as many of us know on this webinar, for people with criminal convictions, and in some cases those who just have arrest records, they face a host of barriers, often referred to as collateral consequences. These consequences impact people's ability to have a roof over their head, work, vote, obtain licenses, get an education, and there are many other barriers. In fact, it is estimated that there are over 50,000 uh, such barriers. And these barriers, they're often broadly applied without specificity or specific considerations such as time of conviction, how it applies to the actual job, and there is really no consensus on the application of these barriers. One of the ways that collateral consequences can be removed is through policy change. Um, many efforts have been forged to address the quote problems of mass incarceration 
And when I interviewed, this was an interest of mine, I, for a master's thesis, I interviewed formerly incarcerated people. And a couple of things stood out that I think are pertinent for our discussion today. When I interviewed them, I can remember many of them saying, I never saw any of us at the table. They would always comment that they saw special interests and in lobbyists and academics often having the largest voices in this space, in spaces of policy making, in education circles, in nonprofit circles. And to be clear, special interests and lobbyists and academics, they all are can be good and they have a place. But those of us who are committed to this work, we need to always be reflective in asking who's at the table. And in asking who's at the table, we are inching towards what this webinar is all about. Putting people who were once or still are at the margins in the center. They should be part of the process, indeed, because we are experts of our experience. And all too often, communities are often the object of policy instead of the architects. Not only do we come away with better policy when we are more inclusive, but there is what I call an empowerment effect as well. People are empowered, many for the first time in their entire life. And I've witnessed this have a profound impact on their lives for many years to come. And this is one of the things that can happen when we create space to move people from the margins to the center. And today we have a few examples of people, places, and organizations that are doing this work and the benefit it produces. And our first presenter is Mr. Glenn Martin. I am going to hand it off to him in just a moment, but I just want to tell you a little bit about Glenn. Glenn is the president and founder of Just Leadership USA. He is part of the vanguard of advocates working to make that future a reality. His goal is to amplify the voice of the people most impacted and to position them as reform leaders. At its core, just Leadership USA challenges the assumption that formerly incarcerated people lack the skills to thoughtfully weigh in on policy reform. Rather, Just Leadership USA is based on the principle that people closest to the problem are also the people closest to its solution. Mr. Martin speaks from personal experience having spent six years incarcerated in a New York State prison in the early 1990s. That experience has informed his career which has been recognized with honors such as the 2017 Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Award and the 2014 Echoing Green Black Male Achievement Fellowship. Mr. Martin is also the founder of the Close Rikers Campaign. And prior to founding Just Leadership USA, he was the president, vice president of the Fortune Society, one of the most respected reentry organizations in the country the co-director of the National Higher Network at the Legal Action Center, and one of the co-founders of the Education from the Inside Out Coalition. So um, everybody, welcome Mr. Glenn Martin to the webinar. Quentin, thank you for that uh, generous introduction. Um, I appreciate it. So a little bit about uh, Just Leadership USA. Well, I mean, let me start here. First of all, thank you for everyone who organized this opportunity. The title, Putting People at the Center, is something that has resonated with me since exiting prison uh, over 15 years ago at this point, particularly because in prison, I found that we lock up some of America's best and brightest, and it doesn't match the rhetoric that we use to discuss uh, who we lock up in this country or why we lock them up. And coming out of prison, I had a number of exceptional opportunities, including working at the Legal Action Center and co-deputy director of the National Higher Network at the Legal Action Center, and then ultimately the vice president of the Fortune Society. Those were huge opportunities for someone who's formerly incarcerated to learn how to do policy advocacy work in a very thoughtful and strategic way around people who've been doing this work for a really long time. And what I quickly realized in the middle of those opportunities is how much um, there was a conversation that would happen in the room uh, with folks who are policy advocacy experts and policymakers, and then there would be a separate conversation in the hallway amongst people who are directly impacted about what they heard in that room that didn't line up with their vision of the work. 
And I, I kept saying to myself, how much more impactful and powerful would we be as a community, as a field, if we were all having those conversations together in the same space? Can I ask you to change the slide, please? And so that led to the birth of Just Leadership USA. And our mission statement, as it says on this slide, is dedicated to cut, cutting the U.S. correctional population in half by 2030 by empowering people most affected by incarceration to drive policy reform. And when we launched back in November 2014, as you can imagine, it was a lonely place to be to suggest that we should be moving towards cutting our correctional population in half, including not just people in prison, but people in jails, people on probation, parole, et cetera. And the reason we launched with such an ambitious goal is twofold. Uh, one is very personal for me. Um, one is that we believed that the field uh, needed to be less uh, incremental or at least have that incremental work couched inside of a much bolder vision that matched the, the scope of the problem. And the other personal reason for me, half by 2030, is I have a, a son, Joshua, who was three at the time when I launched the organization, who will be 18 by 2030. And in this country, one in three black children born today, black males will end up in prison. And I just felt as though I needed that personal sense of urgency to drive the work forward day to day here at Just Leadership USA, the same way I bet many of the people who are listening in on this webinar have similarly personal reasons for doing the work. And so here we believe that people closest to the problem are closest to the solution, but furthest from power and resources. Can I get you to change the slide, please? And so we're very clear about who we are and who we're not. Uh, we don't engage in mission creep very deliberately. Uh, we're very clear to the field about what we do and what we don't do. So we're not a traditional re-entry organization. Most of our leaders have shown uh, that they're beyond the initial re-entry phase and they have some stability and that they've already shown evidence of leadership. And we're very clear and deliberate about that. Um, our theory of change intersects between advocacy leadership training, and membership engagement. And so we run a couple of very distinct leadership trainings. Can I get you to switch slides, please? Um, one is called Leading with Conviction, which is a year-long uh, training. It's competitive. Uh, it's a very diverse audience of fellows that enter into that training, uh, diverse in terms of gender, age, ethnicity, geography, and also type of conviction. We actually very deliberately do not ask the type of conviction for any of our applicants. They can volunteer it if they like, but it's not something we're interested in. Uh, people do tend to share their criminal history when they're engaged in the strategic communications and storytelling work that we do par as part of our leadership training, um, but it's very deliberately not uh, an, ex an entry point into the, into the organization. And the reason is because uh, we believe that every human being has a tremendous uh, ability to do good in this world and, and to do evil in this world and and everyone has that that ability and and everyone has the ability to take their lives and contribute significantly to their community to their families and to this country and we just found that it's just the, the strange thing it's actually people external from just leadership usa that have the most concern about who we serve in our leadership training um, but the type of conviction has never gotten in the way of us delivering a very quality uh, training to our leaders. So the Leader with Conviction training is a year long. Uh, we pay for the entire cost of the training. Our leaders are brought here to New York four times a year for four in-person webinars. They're very long days, 10 hours long, and then a two-hour networking dinner afterwards. Uh, in between these in-person trainings, uh, people engage in about six topical webinars during the year. In addition to that, we do a 360 assessment on each side of the training, which is a very objective tool that's used to measure uh, growth in terms of leadership. Um, we also do peer-to-peer -peer coaching and a heavy amount of executive coaching. And so since we launched in November 2014, we've trained 338 leaders in 27 states uh, plus DC. Our emerging leaders training is a shorter version of the year-long training that we actually move around the country We've done it in nine cities around the country. And so 72 of our leaders have been through the year long and the rest of the 338 have actually been through the emerging leaders training. Uh, with respect to the curriculum, um, we use an adult learning model. Uh, we teach something called breakthrough action leadership and folks can take a look at our website to get a sense of what the core components of breakthrough action leadership includes. 
We also do strategic uh, communications in partnership uh, with the Opportunity Agenda and organizing, and we have an organizing and advocacy overlay that we sometimes do in partnership with Catal and the Legal Action Center and a number of other organizations. Um, we invest in leaders who uh, show up in their storytelling as both victims and quote unquote offenders. Um, but these are all leaders in the movement. These are all people who not just have the potential to be leaders, but have emerged in the field as leaders. And some examples include Bill Cobb from our 2015 cohort, who's now the deputy director of the Smart Justice Campaign at the ACLU, and Deanna Hoskins, who's a 2016 alumni who was hired as the interim deputy director of the Federal Interagency Reentry Council at the Department of Justice. There's Lauren Johnson, who's also hired at the ACLU Texas recently. There's Venus Woods in Alaska, who is a 2017 fellow who is on the advisory committee of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Uh, Patricia McKay, who was selected by the Tennessee Democrats as one of Tennessee's 25 women you need to know. Uh, Richard Smith, 2017 fellow, who was just recently hired as the National Director of Common Justice's Healing Work. Uh, Lily Gonzalez, 2017 fellow, who was hired as a community organizer recently for All of Us or None. And I, the list just goes on and, and on, as, as you can imagine. Uh, can you switch, please, slides? Uh, so we also do advocacy work. With the amount of leadership training that we do, I think people sometimes assume we're strictly a leadership training organization, but it really is leadership training towards movement building. The idea that the participation in these cohorts where people are really challenged in a very uh, intense way to be stronger leaders, people tend to emerge as part of a much stronger community as a result, and we leverage that community and those relationships to engage in advocacy work so the first thing I'll say is in collaboration with the formerly incarcerated and convicted people and families movement, we partnered to do a lot of work in D.C. under the Obama administration where we met with the Department of Justice and presented uh, four different policy recommendations for reform. And within 18 months of the administration winding down, we're able to be successful in three out of four of those policy recommendations at the intersection of employment, education, housing, and voting rights for people with criminal records. Uh, once the administration uh, was winding down, we turned our attention towards New York City, which is where our office is currently housed. And we listened closely to the leaders that we helped train in our emerging leaders training because we believe that they have the best answers to policy reform. And we asked them, what sort of campaign should we take on here locally? And over and over, they kept saying to us, we should work to close Rikers. And that was a difficult place for a brand new organization to land with such an ambitious campaign. And we're nowhere near the finish line. But the reason we did it is that you can talk to researchers and academics and others about the horrors of Rikers, and you can look at the data and the data tells the story. Um, but when you listen to the stories of people who've actually been harmed by Rikers, people who spend time there, um, you know, you quickly realize that the data is really a compilation of the human stories of, of harm that's occurred there. And so we launched the campaign and we quickly educated New Yorkers about the fact that Rikers was 82 acres of land purchased from a person who was once a judge in New York who used to capture black men and return them into slavery in the South. And that since then it's been expanded to 420 acres, uh, so large that it's only 200 feet away from LaGuardia Airport. It is the epitome of the mass incarceration model. And uh, on any given day you have 8,000 people at Rikers, down, however, from 22,000 when I served time at Rikers um, over uh, three decades ago. And citywide, we have 10,000 people locked up. But we do have other smaller jails in New York City, but Rikers has 15,000 beds. We spend $247,000 per bed per year, 89% people of color, We've, in a city where 56% of the people are people of color. 80% of them are detainees, not convicted of the crime they were charged with. 41% have a mental health diagnosis, 12% with serious and persistent mental illness. And there's one correction officer for every detainee in the city where we only have one teacher for every 15 students. And so we got all of this information, much of this information from formerly incarcerated leaders who had participated in our emerging leaders training, people who had served time there, people who understood that there was no repairing Rikers and that we needed to push the city of New York to actually move towards shutting down Rikers. And it was a long shot, um, but within 12 months, we were able to not just finally get the mayor 
to change the policy in New York towards closing Rikers. But we got the governor, the speaker of the city council, 32 council members, the comptroller, and a number of other elected officials and other opinion leaders here in New York City to agree. In addition to participating in an independent commission that was chaired by the chief judge in New York that had formerly incarcerated people as part of the commission's uh, work. And so we also pulled together 156 organizations to support the campaign, some local and, and many uh, national also. And then finally, uh, membership. So we're also a membership organization. We have thousands of members in 42 states. People pay a dollar a month to be members. Some people join the membership and then give a gift of membership to people who are currently incarcerated. And every incarcerated member gets a document from us where they detail their ideas about what we should be doing as an organization with our resources around policy reform. And so that gives a chance to people who are also still in prison to weigh in on the direction of our work. The last slide, please. Um, so just quickly, some of the challenges. Uh, if you hire people who are formerly incarcerated, which we do here very regularly, and if you, in, if you uh, have a commitment to formerly incarcerated people being part of the work, that needs to show up in your budget. Your budget sets your priorities. So if you're running an organization, if you're hiring people who by definition have been the most marginalized and you need to recognize that you're probably hiring people that don't come with the full array of skill sets that you might need for a certain job. And so you put value in the cultural competency they bring to the table, but you also make a very deliberate investment in investing in their leadership. It's something we do here at Just Leadership USA. We invest in trainings for our leaders. We invest in them flying around the country to participate in opportunities that can help expand the breadth of their experiences and so on. Um, and then lastly, you know, people who are directly impacted have a responsibility themselves to build their leadership capacity to respond to opportunities. People tend to point to me as the exception to the rule, but the truth is I've been exposed to exceptional opportunities. And in the middle of those moments, I've taken advantage of those opportunities by investing in myself so that I show up in those spaces in meaningful ways. And the launch of Just Leadership USA, as much as people uh, tend to give us credit for creating something that's pretty phenomenal, the truth of the matter is that for me, at least, it felt very commonsensical based on my almost serendipitous uh, opportunity since exiting prison. I'll stop there. Thank you. Glenn, thank you uh, very, very much um, for the incredible work that you and all the folks at uh, uh, Just Leadership uh, do, and I really appreciate you uh, sharing uh, your time, some of what you all do. Um, as you all can see there, um, there's uh, tons of contact information if you want to get in touch with uh, Glenn or other folks at Just Leadership, or just to learn more or to um, to donate. Um, all of that information is right there. Once again, uh, Glenn, thank you so much. I'm, I'm personally grateful for the work that uh, you all do, and um, I really appreciate it. So next up, we have um, Michelle Rodriguez. Um, she is a senior staff attorney at the National Employment Law Project. Um, it is a nonprofit that is was founded in 1969 that fights for policies to create good jobs, expand access to work, and strengthen protections and support for low-wage workers and the unemployed. Michelle currently leads efforts at NELP to expand job opportunities for people with records through Fair Chance Employment. She has provided legal and technical assistance for Fair Chance laws and policies to over 100 jurisdictions, engaging stakeholders from grassroots organizers to policymakers. Uh, she earned her JD from Columbia Law School in 2003. Everybody welcome Michelle Rodriguez. Hi, Quentin, and hi um, to everyone in the audience. Um, thank you so much. It really is such a pleasure um, to be a part of this webinar. Um, if you could go ahead and advance the slide, that'd be great. Um, and I, I just want to echo to I mean, so much of what uh, Glenn said, just in terms of um, my my own sense of gratefulness to um, have this opportunity to speak on this topic. I think it's uh, really critical to how we all do our work and particularly from um, a national policy research and advocacy organization. I think that we have a lot to learn um, uh, 
about this particular way and strategy. And part of how I have learned has actually been engaging with um, advocates uh, like Glenn Martin, um, you know, Daryl Atkinson, Linda Evans, um, the leaders in the field that have really inspired me um, to make sure that people that with lived experiences are really at the center. And just generally, when I think of you know what we're doing here at NELP, at the National Employment Law Project, as a workers' rights organization, that part of the philosophy that we're trying to bring um, is that people with lived experiences for the work that we're doing, whether we're focused on um, minimum wage, unemployed workers, or people with records, that they are really at the decision-making table. Um, and I think that there's always going to be ways that we can improve, um, and that's something that we have to constantly be thinking about. So my presentation to you all today is going to be highlighting some of the ways that NELP does do the work um, that we do, um, particularly with this focus on um, expanding job opportunities for people that have records. I'll share, of course, you know, some of our accomplishments um, and then, you know, really try to highlight some of that centering of people with lived experiences our work in our work and just kind of weave that all in for you. Um, next slide, please. So one of the things that NELP um, is known for is really its research um, and data. Next slide. Um, and I just want to give you a little bit of a sample of this. Uh, you know, when I think of, you know, the, the, the back up um, uh, data and research that we offer, it really is that, you know, to Glenn's point, that um, stories are key. It's the human um, narrative. It's the individuals is making that connection. I think that that is essential. And what you need in terms of the, the background for those stories are these kinds of data points that can be helpful on the policy level. And part of the, the thinking, the philosophy that we bring at NELP is how can we decide disseminate that information? How can we offer um, the work that we're doing to help ensure that the movement at the grassroots level, at um, the community level is moving forward? And part of what we can offer is um, compiling the data, compiling that research. So to here as an example, this is a page from um, one of our uh, resource guides that we put together. And you'll see this key data point, 70 million people in the United States have some type of record, and that's nearly one in three adults in the U.S. And that's a number um, and an estimate that um, uh, we developed and have disseminated widely to really bring home that point that there is such a tremendous population of people um, that have had uh, contact with the criminal justice system, that this is not an isolated problem at all. This is something that we all have to be all in to be able to solve. And people with lived experiences are going to have to be at the center of that um, problem solving because they have the expertise. Next slide, please. Another type of research that we offer besides compiling information and trying to ensure that it's um, easy uh, for advocates, for grassroots organizers, for formerly led, um, formerly incarcerated led groups to really be able to capture, are trying to do some of our, our own original um, uh, research and um, summarizing as well. So one of the things that we did was uh, we put together a report unlicensed and untapped, which really highlighted occupational licensing barriers. And that's something else that we can offer as an organization, as a national organization, is to share out what are some of the trends and problems that we're seeing nationally? We get to have this opportunity to have this scope where we're in contact with um, uh, the grassroots organizations, the, the Heartland Alliances, you know, the, um, the um, uh, the picos of the different um, states and understand, you know, from people that are on the ground, what are they seeing? What are they seeing in their own communities? What are they seeing in the states? And we try to lift up certain trends and then report that back out then to that larger community. And so here's an example of that. The over 27,000 um, occupational licensing restrictions that uh, were collected in the um, ABA Collateral Consequences database. And again, it's to give that kind of snapshot of this problem is tremendous and we have to be there to solve it. Next slide, please. 
And taking that national scope, this was another example from um, that report, Unlicensed and Untapped. Um, we did a ranking of the different uh, policies and laws that are out there, and we're able then to be able to share that out um, with the different communities across the country of how those laws are, and hopefully support then the kind of efforts that are happening in your states um, so that you can move forward the policies um, as well. Next slide. And one of the key ways that we do that as well, not only with the research and you know, disseminating that information, but really trying to put together then the kinds of toolkits, uh, resource guides, and providing technical assistance, again, to be in that, um, uh, that background space where we help support um, the efforts of the groups that are taking the lead on this. So next slide. One of the um, most popular uh, guides that we have uh, catalogs um, all the all the laws um, on the books for um, ban the box and you know for more expansive laws as well that are related um, that have been coined fair chance laws that um, also incorporate the EEOC guidance. So those are now we have 29 states over 150 localities and. Part of that, that dialogue that we're creating by, by being able to collect that information and share it out um, it just helps keep the information flow going. It helps keep the, the drumbeat going. And that is how we see part of our role in this larger movement is to share out that information. Next slide. And a popular way that we've done that as well is through um, uh, the creation of toolkits. So if our philosophy is that we don't want to be the holders of, you know, the, of the information, we want to share that out, then part of that has to be a commitment to um, developing the resources that then can be freely and easily accessed. So what we tried to do is um, from my own experiences, um, my colleagues' experiences of working with jurisdictions across the country on Ban the Box and Fair Chance Laws, we tried to really distill those lessons learned and then put them um, in a toolkit that then can be used by anybody, by any of the advocates, so any of the leaders um, on the ground that are trying to get something started, even if they're in a tiny community, this is something that they can go to as a resource and it's freely available and it's a way to just ensure knowledge is being shared out. And I think of for all of the, the national groups, for that's part of um, um, you know, our, our um, responsibility to make sure that we're not the holders of, um, you know, some rarefied information, but that it is um, freely being uh, disseminated out. Uh, one other, next slide, please. And one other just example of, um, of a toolkit that we put together, for example, was looking specifically at the healthcare sector. And, and I would say that I think of this as one role that NELP can play too, if there are particular relationships that we've been able to cultivate, you know, you know, here's an example with healthcare systems or employers, then those are then relationships that we can share out. Um, that's another role that national groups can play is really helping to broker those relationships um, with groups um, that are led by formerly incarcerated people and people with records. Next slide. And to give you an example of that, um, next slide, I want to just uh, share out uh, one of the toolkits that we put together. Um, it's uh, the Fair Chance Hiring and Philanthropy Toolkit, and we worked uh, with the Executives Alliance and with um, the Formerly Incar Incarcerating Convicted Peoples and Families Movement, which is led by formerly incarcerated leaders. And the way that this process worked, to just give you an example of how you can um, you know, do a uh, uh, a broad collaboration is we were working um, both with HR professionals and then um, we were working with different committees of the different groups. So we had um, FIC PFM um, together with the Executive Alliance and with NELP and really put together this um, very collaborative process um, to get this toolkit in the hands of um, foundations. And the purpose was to help ensure that foundations 
are going to really do the hiring of people with records and not just, you know, not just the idea of you're hiring people with records just to do, you know, criminal justice work or something that's very focused on um, uh, the lived experience, but understanding if we're going to really shift the culture um, of um, foundations, then there needs to be hiring at every level of the organization. So it's not going to just be limited then um, to, you know, let's say your criminal justice fellow. We want to see hiring at all levels. And what this, I think this collaboration was uh, a really good opportunity as well was to bring together HR professionals who were in foundations themselves and have a direct um, project with um, uh, formerly incarcerated leaders. And so it was really this opportunity of potentially transformative learning and the hope as well is by having this tangible toolkit, then we're going to see more people with records throughout the ranks of foundations. And for many of us who are in the nonprofit um, sector, the foundations are, are essential in terms of our, our health and our well-being as organizations and doing this work. And so that's why it is so critical that you know, we, we took this um, endeavor together to help ensure sure that that um, hiring does become real. And I will say this, you know, having this deliberative process where you're working with different committees to draft something, um, it's, it's a long process. I mean, it, it took regular meetings. It takes a commitment of um, investing that time and energy. It would be much easier if, you know, just one person drafted it up and got it done, but it wouldn't be the, it wouldn't be with the spirit of the project. You wouldn't have as good of a final project, it wouldn't be um, as effective as it needed to be. So I would say doing this kind of collaboration by centering people with lived, ex uh, lived experiences in the actual work that's being done, in the creative um, thinking, in the decision making, that's just better for the work. It's more aligned and with the purpose and it helps um, just with the authenticity and the credibility of the final product as well. Um, next slide. Um, and next slide, uh, moving forward. I just wanted to give you all just a snapshot, too, of some of the other things that um, uh, you can do if you're in an organization um, as well. Uh, and if you're looking at your own hiring of um, bringing on people with records, that should be a key part of the work that you're doing. And another key part as well is to consistently be thinking of where are the opportunities that we can help support um, formerly incarcerated uh, led groups in their efforts. So whether it's um, in the White House effort and, you know, you can try to, you know, provide, you know, some uh, legal ep expertise as, as to help um, in some of the background uh, uh, work that's being done. That's something that we tried to do. Or, you know, for different um, pieces of testimony that's needed, helping to support um, uh, different groups, ensuring that they have the information that they need um, to move forward um, a piece of legislation. Those are all different ways that we have tried to ensure that we're being supported of, of the movement on the ground as well. So not just doing the the research and, um, you know, the, the policy work, but also helping to support those those, those actions that are happening. Um, next slide, please. And finally, I, I also think of just what is part of our um, obligation um, in terms of ensuring that the, the movement uh, uh, really moves forward and 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 uh, thrives is to helping ensure when we as a national organization um, have access um, to uh, larger funds, um, you know that maybe some smaller groups wouldn't have access to. So some um, nascent organizations, burgeoning groups, um, they may not have access to some of these larger foundations because they're only giving them to the larger budget organizations. That it's part of our commitment then to ensure that. That we're making those introductions, that we're exposing those foundations to um, the groups that are doing the work on the ground, and that we are also helping to, um, with our, these funds, regrant that money out. And as part of that criteria and thinking about where that regranting is going, a key um, criterion needs to be. Um, is this uh, a group that is run with that philosophy and thinking of 
formerly incarcerated people, people with records and lived experiences are at the center? Is it being led by people with lived experiences? Is that something that's throughout um, the culture and thinking of how the work and policy uh, making, the decision making is being done? Um, so that is part of um, what we see ourselves as doing uh, moving forward uh, in, in our opportunities for regranting as well and, and currently. Um, next slide. This takes us to just um, our final contact information that I wanted to share with you all. Um, please feel free to get in contact with me um, to learn more about our work or if you have um, any questions. And I, I also just want to reflect as well as our own organization with our hiring practices, one of the things that you can do very easily um, as an organization is to adopt um, your own um, hiring practices. We, we have a fair chance hiring policy. We don't actually run background checks and we're affirmatively um, signal that um, people with contact with the criminal justice system are welcome and encouraged that that is um, part part of how we see the expertise needed of the work that's being done um, at NELP. And that's something that um, uh, all, I think all organizations should be doing. All of Us Are None several years ago had a campaign uh, to have um, Ban the Box adopted by nonprofits and that was a pledge that was available and for more information um, from how that can be possible, All of Us Are None is, uh, you can find their contact information online. Um, they're affiliated with legal services with prisoners with children. And with that, thank you so much um, for your time and uh, letting me be a part of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Michelle. That was um, excellent. And you raised uh, some some great, great points. Um, I, I really I want to get to the Q&A. You brought some things up that were excellent. But uh, we have uh, one more awesome uh, presenter uh, before us before we get to the Q&A. But I just want to say in the same way that I said to um, to Glenn, um, I am, again, personally grateful for the work that um, you all do at uh, NELP um, in supporting and including uh, people uh, with records, and I and I just really um, appreciate it, and, um, and 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 I'm glad that we had you to participate um, in this webinar today and sharing uh, some of the awesome work that you do and some of um, you know what you hope that we can do. So I mean, I, I like how you said you know push moving it forward and like what's the what's the next step. So I appreciate that. So now we have. Um, Mr. Marlon Chamberlain. Um, just a quick um, um, introduction for Mr. Chamberlain. So Marlon was uh, released from federal prison on May 29, 2012, after serving 10 years. Uh, following his release, he began working with FORCE, which is an acronym for Fighting to Overcome Records and Create Equality. It's an initiative of the Community Renewal Society led by people with records. Marlon is currently um, part of the Rocky Coalition, which he will explain in a second, which is another acronym, uh, Restoring Rights and Opportunities Coalition of Illinois. And Marlon believes that through his experience that God has prepared him for this work, he's a devoted family man who continues to put his faith into action by building relationships with congregations and like-minded people to fight against racism, discrimination, and poverty. Everyone, welcome Marlon Chamberlain. Thank you, uh, Quentin, for that introduction. Um, and as um, it's also an honor and a pleasure to be on the panel uh, with Glenn and Michelle and just talking about how important it is for people with lived experience um, to really lead and direct this work. Um, can we go to the, to the next slide? And so just to give a, a little context, um, about the Rocky Coalition and also about the, the state of Illinois. Um, we currently like now have 4 million people um, that are either on some sort of probation, have been convicted or have, uh, or have been incarcerated. And, and just like I said, to lay the context, Springfield, the capital of, of Illinois is almost a three and a half hour drive. Um, and we'll talk about some of the challenges that we face when we have to make those trips on a weekly basis. Um, also, 40% of the state of the pop, uh, state's population lives in Cook County, um, and like I said, there are 4 million people in the state with convictions, but 49.6 of those 
of the prison population is from Cook County. Uh, most of our state, state prisons are three to seven hours away. Um, and Illinois is a democratic state, a democratic uh, state, but most Democrats outside of Cook County are not in favor of criminal justice reform. And they also represent entire towns who are dependent on, pris on prisons. Um, next slide. And so when you hear about uh, Illinois uh, and you hear about the politics in Illinois, uh, for the most part, you, you, always, you always hear people talk about the budget and how we haven't had a budget. Um, well, we have one now, but we hadn't had one in almost two years. Uh, and so some of the challenges that we face with the talk around the budget is we have to learn how to navigate around the politics of Illinois uh, as far as like uh, certain politicians having to, to 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 give favors to others, or they can't vote uh, for certain bills because it affects how they can vote on on other budget issue bills. Um, and so we'll talk about some of the challenges that we've also faced, um, not just with uh, some of the Democrat Democrat um, state representatives who have prisons in their towns, but also we have to talk about like how we navigate around the issues around the budget. Uh, next slide. Okay, so um, if you if you look at this slide, you can see when we talk about criminal justice reform, uh, which is a bipartisan issue in Illinois. If you look at this slide, you can see that that you have all of these experts um, who come together to talk about solutions when it comes to criminal justice reform. Next slide. But one of the things that that we noticed and learned was that. At these tables, there was the, the people with lived experience who really have the solutions as to what could have prevented people from going to prison or what could help a person not return to prison were lacking at these tables. And so we knew we had to do something. And so in 2013, um, we launched the, the Rocky Coalition, which Quentin explained is an acronym that stands for Restoring Rights and Opportunities Coalition of Illinois. Um, and, and we believed in these principles, which basically says that Illinois needs a fair system of justice that recognizes human dignity. Regardless of their past, everyone deserves to have a meaningful, meaningful future. And number three, together, we can drive solutions with a community voice. Next slide. And so as I said before, in, in 2013, um, with the help of the, the criminal advocates table, is which was formerly used, what that was our name before we created Rocky, um, we decided that that a lot of our groups like Force and CGLA and Chicago Coalition for the Homeless, um, they were having meetings, uh, but these were separate meetings. You had policy advocates meeting talking about criminal justice reform. Um, you had groups like the reentry committee at the uh, CCH and forced meeting to talk about criminal justice reform. And then you had um, organizers who were working to organize people to address uh, criminal justice reform. So we thought, what if we could bring all of these different uh, agencies together um, and to create something to where policy advocates could listen to leaders as they develop and write policy, and then organizers could go out and train leaders on how to, to organize and how to lobby uh, these bills to actually make and create a, a coalition of people that, that will help us all learn from one another, but also help us when it comes to advocacy and really developing policy that really helps and, and that helps people that are directly impacted. Uh, next slide. And so, as I said before, why did we do it? Because we believe that people with records are experts at their own experience. And, and I like to say that um, the reason I consider myself an expert is because I've been able to stay out of prison for almost five years. Um, and, and there are people who also can tell you what would have helped them prevent them uh, from even going to prison. The second one is no one tells our stories better than us, and we create our own narratives. So we get to tell our own stories around what we believe people with records look like, what we believe people with records talk like, what we act like, and we can help shape and create our own narratives as we continue to evolve as people. And the last one says, we are the ones who can shift the narrative. Um, and, and like I said before, we can shift that narrative by showing people that, uh, that we as formerly incarcerated people are married, we're students at school, uh, we have jobs, and we live just like normal people. Um, next slide. 
And so what did, what did the Rocky Coalition do? In 2016, uh, we worked on four bills at one time, which was very difficult at time. As I mentioned before, uh, keep in mind that Springfield is a three and a half hour drive. And so these were trips where we had to wake up at four o'clock in the morning to get on the train at six o'clock to get to Springfield at 10 o'clock in the morning. And then we would have a short time span um, to look for different legislators, which, like I said, we, we were working on four different bills. And so that means we had to memorize all of the information from each one of these bills. We had to have our talking points. And so a lot of preparation uh, and training happened on the trains, well, the buses and cars on the way to Springfield. And in, in 2016, we worked to remove lifetime barriers to employment um, in the schools, park districts, and in the healthcare licensing. And, and also, the, uh, we improved the healthcare worker registry and created a task force that includes com community members so that we can continue to look for ways that we can improve on the registry system. And as I said, as I said before, the, the, the other bills, there were, uh, prior to us working on these three different bills that removed the lifetime barriers, if you had a, a, a conviction, um, regardless of when this conviction happened, you were barred from working in the schools, park districts, and, and you were barred from certain licensing um, as far as in the uh, healthcare uh, field. And so we decided, like I said before, that we wanted to, to remove these lifetime barriers to employment. Uh, and, and we actually, all four of these bills passed and were signed into law uh, in 2016. So now people with criminal convictions can actually apply to work in schools and in the healthcare industries uh, and in the park districts. And here in Chicago, um, the reason why we chose these particular bills is because a lot of employment opportunities really are really around these four different industries when we talk about what's in our neighborhoods. Um, and so, like I said, this came from leaders saying, hey, I was denied from working as a safe passage worker uh, at this particular school in my neighborhood. Um, or I was denied licensing, which I went to school after my conviction and became a registered nurse, and then I lost my licensing because of a law that passed that, that like Quentin talked about before, was a, a collateral consequence. And so these issues came from the leaders at the Rocky Table saying these are some of the barriers that I've faced and, and, and need to be removed in order for me to move forward in my life. Uh, next, next slide. This year, 2017, uh, we worked on a bill, HB 2373, um, which, which was probably one of our most difficult um, bills that we've worked on as of yet, um, because this particular bill um, would expand ceiling eligibility for people with violent and nonviolent convictions. And we intentionally like, like decided to do this because we wanted to, to stop the distinction between violent and nonviolent convictions. And I think I heard Glenn mention that they don't ask about your conviction as far as like their, their enrollment into their program, because we also, we don't want to make that distinction be saying, uh, pretty much saying that anyone can change. Um, and so we like currently in the state of Illinois, there were nine convictions that could be sealed. Um, and with this bill, there will be thousands of convictions that can be sealed after three years uh, of that person's released and, and when their probation or parole has ended. Um, we, this bill is currently sitting on the governor's desk. Um, it passed out of the House with bipartisan um, support, bi bipartisanship support, um, and it passed out of the Senate. So we're currently waiting on Governor Rauner to sign that bill. Next slide. So how do we do this? Um, and I think we need to go to the next slide so we can break down each one of those. Um, as I said before, our issues come from the community. So last year, what we did was we used a survey that we created to really identify what particular issues were people with rec records facing as far as their transition from prison back out to society. Um, and we used the survey, but we also used, we believe in building relationships. So this survey was used for us to collect information and data, but we also believe in like, we would follow up with individuals from, these sur from this survey to get them involved in the actual work that we did as a coalition. And so the questions that we would ask on the survey would, would basically, they helped us shape um, our campaign for the last, uh, I think it was for last year. 
The second point says that we train leaders to be at the table. So like I said before, we train people, um, we meet month, monthly and we talk about different ways that, that uh, we, can, we can get people with records involved, whether it's uh, teaching people about um, the political process in Springfield, how a, ba a bill passes out of um, the, the legislator, um, how many votes do we need to pass a bill in the House and Senate and what that process looks like. Um, we also train leaders on how to lobby um, the, the, the bill that we're working on and how to find the different representatives' offices. Um, and then we also talk about um, just training leaders on how to make decisions once we're at the table, um, how, to, how to perfect telling your story um, and responding to legislators when, when they say, well, I don't want to support this bill, or they give us like any sort of feedback as far as like uh, what they're objecting or they're agreeing to the bill. Next slide. Okay, how we do it, um, the coalition consists of, like I said, uh, Chicago Coalition for the Homeless, Cabrini Green Legal Aid Force, and Heartland Alliance. And so what we do is we meet uh, once a month as a coalition, and this is what we call like our big meetings. Um, and when we need to make quick decisions, the coalition basically voted and assigned individuals from each organization um, to be on the steering committee. And this, this steering committee, um, has to make decisions sometimes on the fly, or sometimes we may have a short time span or turnaround um, to make a decision. And so we'll we'll set up a conference call or we'll have a check-in to just just check in to make sure if there are any decisions that we need to make um, as far as the coalition, or um, are there any quick decisions that we need to make as a steering committee to move our campaign forward. And pretty much the larger table pretty much sets the, the vision for each session as far as how many trips we'll make to Springfield, how many uh, leaders we want to, to try to take on each one of these trips. And then also they would pretty much set the agenda as far as like which organization will lead um, the trips to Springfield throughout the, the legislative session. Uh, next slide. And so how we do it. Um, I just talked about how we, we assign different weeks um, to different organizations to take trips to Springfield. But I think the unique thing that we do is um, we, we have a constant presence in Springfield because we have different organizations that can say, hey, I'll take this week or I'll take these next two weeks. And so we keep a constant presence in Springfield and we, we, we stay in the legislative spaces to remind them, yes, I was here last year, last week and I talked to you about this particular bill and we check in to see like if they want more information, we make sure we, we have uh, report back forms that we write down what uh, each leader, what that representative said to that leader um, and, and we've learned over the last two years um, that this works. Uh, in fact, last year when one of our bills passed, um, the legislator, the General Assembly, gave us a standing ovation and said that we had, that the, uh, the HB 4360, uh, the school bill, was one of the, the most lobbied bills in, in Springfield. So we've learned that having this constant presence in Springfield is actually effective. Uh, next slide. And also, uh, a lot of times in Springfield, you'll have people who are professional lobbyists who this is their career and, and, and this is what they do for a living. And so one of the unique things that we do is that we, we as leaders are the ones who actually lobby on um, these bills. And so we're able to respond to uh, the responses that the legislators give us because we have lived experience. Like we know um, what it's like to, to come home from prison and have to navigate through all the challenges that we face coming home. And so we train leaders to actually lobby um, our own bills. Next slide. And so as we talked about before, this is just a, a quick snapshot of, of how the coalition makes decisions uh, and how the steering committee decides uh, or makes decisions. And it also shows that we have one person uh, from each organization, one policy person, one leader, and one organizer from each group. And that makes up the steering committee. Um, and this is just, like I said, a quick quick snapshot of, of how we as the coalition make decisions um, depending on what like time or what, what part of our campaign or uh, where we are as far as the uh, legislative session. Um, and there are even uh, points in times where 
we in Springfield, and we have to just try to pull people from the st steering committee, as many people as possible, to make an immediate decision to move our campaign forward. Uh, next slide. Okay, and this is just a picture of the coalition. As you can see, the yellow shirts are uh, Chicago Coalition of the Homeless. The orange shirts are the Community Renewal Society and Force. Uh, and then Cabrini Green Legal Aid is there and Heartland Alliance. And this, this is our coalition here. And I think we took this picture this, picture this year after uh, the ceiling bill passed out of the House or Senate. I don't remember. Uh, but like I said before, we, we've... We take trips every week to Springfield, um, and each group uh, com commits to turning out leaders. And, and, and I think that that's one of the most important things um, that we've learned as a coalition is that, that we have to be in Springfield every week. And this is a way for people to also learn the process, um, because the way we're taught uh, politics in school is not the way politics plays out in real life. And so, um, as I mentioned before, when I talked about like the budget issues, like there's a lot of things that, that play out um, in Springfield that you just have to be there to learn. And, and after each trip to Springfield on our way home, we debrief the day, we draw out the learning, we talk about things that we can improve on and do better. Um, and then we also just make sure that leaders are, are, are learning the process and that they're asking questions um, about like where we are in the process or how many votes do we need. Um, we keep track of, of where we are as far as our roll call and who talks to who and people that we need to touch on next week. Um, so there's a lot of work that happens um, behind closed doors, um, but, but we've, we've been able to accomplish a lot of, of, of lot of things as far as like passing legislation. We've actually passed five bills since I've been at CRS. Um, and like I said, it's, it's a lot of hard work, a lot of dedication and sacrifice that goes into this work. Uh, next slide. And, and so uh, thank you, Quentin, for my time. And I think we are now ready for questions. Yep, yep. Thank you so much, uh, Marlon. I, you know, as you were speaking, um, you know, uh, as, as as Marlon mentioned, uh, Heartland Alliance is part of this coalition. So I've had the, the pleasure at working side by side with, um, you know, Marlon. So some of the things that he was talking about just really, you know, just got me uh, really, really, really excited. So um, I am um, really excited to uh, get to the Q&A. So we have three uh, general questions. And let me just say this really quick. Thank you to uh, all three of our presenters. And I'll give another thank you. But I can't thank you all enough. I mean, I think this has been incredibly inspiring and, and wonderful. I'm ready to run off this webinar and go do some more work. And uh, because you all um, have thoroughly inspired me uh, today, and I hope those of you are li that are listening um, have been inspired as well. But um, I'm going to go with some, uh, please send your questions. Uh, we do have, we're, we're great on time right now. Um, so we have about 25 minutes left. So we, I've gotten, I've received three general questions that can go to either one of the panelists, but I did get one directed question. Um, so I'm going to go with the directed question first, and then we're going to go uh, to some of the general questions that uh, anybody uh, that participated on the panel can answer. But the first question that was directed at Marlon, which is a great question, and I'm sure he'll have plenty to say about this. So Marlon, uh, someone wants to know, can you explain how you got bipartisan support for the record ceiling bill? That is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, it is amazing. Um, and so I, I talked about the, the politics of, of Illinois. Uh, and so there was uh, another bill um, that the Republicans were looking for some support on um, from the, the Democrats. Uh, and so in, in order, like I, in order for like basically the way it was laid out, it was that if the Republicans signed on and supported this ceiling bill that the Repu Republicans were expecting uh, the Democrats to support. Um, I think it was a bill revolving around, well, it was a bill involving around gun enhancements. Um, and so there were some backdoor meetings that, that happened between Representative Lilly uh, and some of the Republican leadership uh, around who would support what. Uh, and our, our bill passed what I think we had, how many votes? 80. 
80, 80 votes in support of, of, of House Bill 2373. So I would just kind of summarize that by saying it was, all, it was really in the negotiation of, of, of the Republicans saying, hey, if, if we support uh, the ceiling bill that we're expecting you to support um, of the legislation that comes up from um, Republican sponsors. Great, great. Um, I hope that answered your question. Um, it, it's a lot of hard work uh, to get that amount of support. We had a lot of hard work, but also some politics played along with that. But it was mostly the work and the leaders. And I would just add uh, one thing. We had a leader, um, you know, speak to the entire um, uh, house, right, that they've spoken. We have leaders that have face to face with everyone. So we we go talk to everybody. We talk to Republicans, we talk to them. We go to their office and leaders go there. So everybody in that house and that Senate, they know who we are because we go and see every single one of them. So uh that's part of it as well. We we are coming and talking to representatives and senators and telling them um you know our stories and and what life is really like. So um on to the general questions um and this I'm going to open it up um, this is for anyone to answer, so uh, Michelle or Glenn, feel free to jump in. Uh, the question is a, is a good one. It says, the face of incarceration is changing, plus there are more people with records that also have education and special skills. There seems to be very little attention paid to these people in reentry assistance. It says they can be harder to place in employment because very few white white collar um, companies will consider someone with any type of criminal background. Is anything being done about this? My loved one is personally affected by this. So I, I, I think the question is, there are folks with records that have white collar skills, but these white collar jobs are not often the, the focus of reentry organizations. And uh, this person wants to know what is being done. I think, Michelle, this kind of gets at what you were saying, hiring at every level. So I don't know if you wanted to take a shot at this. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I think it raises a really good point of the kinds of stereotypes that exist there and the general work that we all need to do about breaking the stereotypes. Absolutely, we've gotten calls from workers at, at, that have, um, you know, PhDs and masters and, you know, are, are well qualified for a wide range um, of jobs um, and are absolutely not being um, uh, taken seriously um, for those jobs, there's so much work that needs to be done um, with change, doing that narrative sh uh, shifting work, as as Marlon was talking about. Um, so I think you know part of it is just helping to understand, um, helping the the movement and you know policymakers and decision makers understand that when we're talking about 70 million people that have an arrest or conviction record, that's going to be a wide range of folks who are very highly skilled. Um, many of them. Um, and who all they need to have is, you know, that that door opened um, of opportunity. And yes, there's absolutely people in the population as well that need, you know, more of the support and the, the trauma of being in contact with the criminal justice system is very serious. And um, that kind of supportive system um, can be helpful in the kind of training and leadership um, that Glenn talked about as well. But there is a, a wide range of folks um, that are out there. And part of what we have to do is just um, do that kind of stereotype breaking. And so I, I think that there's um, there is more that uh, we all can do on that. And there are some specific efforts, you know, specifically with, I, I think of some of the private employers that we've been, uh, some initiatives that we've been trying to work on. So that's just an example. Um, this, is, this is Glenn, just to weigh in quickly. Um, yep. Going back to my days as Vice President of Fortune Society, there was a gentleman who came in, I guess this is going back about six years now, who was a former doctor who was trying to find employment and ran up against uh, these uh, these weird sort of uh, barriers based on the fact that the reentry field had not evolved enough to recognize that we're serving a very diverse population given the scope and the reach of our correctional system in the United States. And I received a call from him just couple of weeks ago, in fact, where he continues to be under, tremendously underemployed as someone who used to once uh, practice medicine. And, you know, I would, I would turn the lens on us as a field and suggest that uh, organizations 
that have been around doing good work that have grown and become uh, pretty formidable in this space need to constantly challenge themselves to evolve to respond to uh, what formerly incarcerated people are saying they need. And if you look at our leadership uh, training, if you look at the fellows across all of our cohorts, people often are surprised by the diversity, uh, particularly in race and ethnicity and geography, but there's also a huge amount of diversity there in terms of what people were engaged in pre-incarceration or pre-supervision, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that's very deliberate for us. We want our leadership cohorts to reflect the, the reality of who we lock up in this country so that every American can hopefully see a bit of themselves or their families in the advocacy work being done by these fellows. Thanks for that, uh, Glenn. And, uh, you know, um, just uh, while, while, while you have the, the floor, there was a question that was directed uh, directly at you. At you. Uh, you had just mentioned your uh, leadership uh, training and Nicole Holmes, um, she wanted to know, um, is that training available uh, to individuals that are currently incarcerated? So we've grown quickly, but very deliberately. And so we've been asked by particularly correction officials, but also people in prison to do our training inside of a prison setting. We created a curriculum uh, from scratch, tabula rasa, like worked with Columbia Law School to interview formerly incarcerated people all across the country to develop the curriculum. And I don't want to be so presumptuous to assume that that curriculum, which is great and has evolved into a very powerful curriculum, can uh, just easily be used for people who are in a correctional setting. And so we have a vision for ultimately providing uh, some version of our leadership training inside of a prison setting but I just don't think we're there yet as an organization. And I, again, I want to be—I want to have the humility to, to believe that it, we're going to have to listen more to people on the inside about what they need. Thanks uh, for answering that question, uh, Glenn. We have um, a couple more. I'm going to throw out a general question uh, as well. This is for anybody. We do have a couple of more specific uh, questions, but um, I want to get this uh, general question. Um, there was a question that came in. It says, if you work in criminal justice reform, how would you suggest working towards centering formerly incarcerated people in your work, research, and advocacy? Well, one idea um, is, uh, you know, hiring people <laughs> um, in your staff. That actually helps, you know, helps change the conversation in the organization. If you have people with lived experiences um, and that are, are, you know, in the conversations internally, uh, part of the decision making, um, then that's, that will help um, be able to shift and move um, uh, some of the work that's being done, uh, potentially. That, that's one idea. Um, you know, I want to reiterate something that was said earlier about the importance of regranting. We're a very new organization, less than three years old, uh, with a budget of $3.6 million, and we regrant almost a million dollars of those resources and target most of it to organizations that are either led by formerly incarcerated people or where formerly incarcerated people are in meaningful leadership roles. And we do that so that we're constantly in partnership, not just with organizations led by people who have lived experience but resourcing those organizations to leverage the playing field a bit and ensure that we're being accountable to other formerly incarcerated leaders. Um, I don't think anyone, you know, I think people shouldn't let perfect be the enemy of the good to use an outused statement. I mean, even here at Just Leadership, I'd like to think that we do a good job of what we do, but no one is in jeopardy of being an expert at this. And I would just urge people to do to really follow their values and and do what seems right in terms of elevating those voices and centering uh, people who've uh, been directly impacted in the work. Uh, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, we are getting great questions coming in. I'm loving this uh, right now. We're getting great um, questions. So I'm going to ask a very tough question, and I'm sure all of us. Uh, in this work have encountered uh, this question. I know we have in uh, Springfield and we it comes up over and over and over again. Uh, so I'm just going to ask it because it's a tough question and some of the things, the question is not going to go away. We're going to have to continue to think about it and think through how do we do this. But the question is, uh, came from uh, someone who asked, 
are sex offenders included in your advocacy? Is there a quote, what works data available for replication purposes? Now, I don't know if they meant specifically replicating advocacy for sex offenses, but I'm sure we can probably just answer the replication question in other contexts, but that was a question. Yeah, this, this is Glenn. Let me jump in on this one. And it's hard for me to tell if the question again, is what you said about policy around people with sex offenses or the inclusion of them in the work. So I'll answer the latter because I have an anecdotal story to tell. Um, as I said earlier, we don't ask people about the type of convictions when they come into our leadership training. And yet when we do strategic communications work, we do something called VPSA, Value Problem Solution Action, where people tend to try to tell their personal story and do it in a way uh, that's really effective um, uh, towards policy reform. And on our first cohort ever, when we launched the organization back in November 2014, about, a, uh, about an hour and a half into the first leadership training, someone stood in front of the room and he was telling his story. And about three minutes into a five minute presentation, he said, and I slept with my daughter. And as you can imagine, for some people in the room, it was a bit of a punch in the gut. Um, but I thought it was a moment that was so important and a moment we could not have manufactured and a moment that in many ways I wish I could replicate over and over because it forces other formerly incarcerated leaders in the room to reckon with whether they're looking for a criminal justice system that works for everyone or just for people who deserve a better working criminal justice system. And for formerly incarcerated people not to replicate the mistakes that have been made over the last few decades in the reform space I thought it was really important for them to have that moment and to overcome that moment and to recognize that, you know, for all of us, creating a fairer, smaller, more humane criminal justice system is not about where would you want your son to serve time, it's about where would you want the person who violated your son to serve time. And our leaders, because we allowed sex offenders into the space, um, had a moment like that that I think, again, was hugely valuable. Wow, that was, uh, I think what you said, uh, Glenn, about that moment, because I think, I mean, we're sitting here now, and we, that was like, wow, I, we can, I, you know, to be there is probably one thing, um, and, and but I definitely, um, that that moment, I, I'm sure it was very powerful, and you're right, like, we have to, we do have to reckon with, you know, like, are we making these distinctions, right? Like, what kind of distinctions are we making? Are we saying that the good people over here, the bad people over here, and then this is what we do with the bad people, and this is what we do with the good people? So, um, and I think that particular issue really forces us to rethink how we think about criminal justice reform and, and, and really pushes us to think, like, what do we really want? So, um, I appreciate you sharing that 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 story and that vignette because I think it's um, um, extremely important. And um, Quentin, hi, this is Michelle. I'll just make one one brief comment on that as well. Um, just from a policy point um, too, it, this comes up quite often. Um, whether it's people that have sex offenses or people that quote unquote have violent offenses or more you know quote unquote serious offenses, whatever it is, it comes up a time and time again when you're working on some policy measure that there is someone that always says, well, let's you know, okay, that reform, it's all good, but let's exclude fill in the blank it's people with sex offenses or people you know that have you know certain um, uh, offenses on that table and it undercuts everyone um, because of that distinction that you are making as you were talking about Quentin of, of trying to carve out who is the good and deserving and who is the not deserving and that creep will always undermine the the spirit of the work. Now, those are hard decisions um, when you're at that decision-making table um, to make where you're you're holding this piece of, uh, you know, legislation that's going to do a tremendous good for thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people, and you're having to make that call. But it, it needs to be weighed very seriously. It has to be thought of, well, is this undermining our whole, our whole effort? Um, and I think that there have been a lot of mistakes um, in the past in the reform movement where it was too easy to say oh yeah of course no brainer where you know where we can't include you know those you know, those offenses and that has that has hurt us um, overall so I, I appreciate that um, that piece of the conversation and that that challenge that we're we're bringing to the fore 
Thanks, uh, Michelle. Um, so we have a, a directed question, another directed question that was specifically directed at Marlon, but uh, Michelle and Glenn, I would love to hear your thoughts on this as well, because this is something, you know, in this work that I've thought about and that have had um, side conversations about, but something that I really um, would love to hear your thoughts, but we'll let uh, the question go to Marlon first. And um the question is, it says, I've been finding it challenging to truly engage my community in legislative work because we are an oppressed population and balancing many obligations. Have you been able to secure funding for leaders to cover time off of work, child care, and transportation so they can share their expertise and spend time lobbying, or are you reliant on volunteers? Wow, great question. Definitely a great question. Um, the the short answer, um, I would say uh, the transportation piece, we do cover um, as far as the trips to Springfield, but the the other two are the challenges um, that I've faced as an organizer as far as trying to engage people. Um, and, and a lot of it has been just um, building like the relational work and connecting people to different resources. Um, we have not secured any funding for, for people uh, to take trips to Springfield, um, but I do, because FORCE is connected to a lot of uh, different reentry agencies, whatever resources um, that I can connect people to, a lot of that, that work is just like really just networking and connecting people to different resources. Um, but that is definitely one of the, the biggest challenges um, that we face as far as trying to engage people, because people, uh, when, when I talk to someone about getting involved in going to Springfield, a lot of times their first response is, is I need a job. Uh, and so um, that's, that has definitely been one of the challenges that, that we faced. Uh, and then too, a lot of times with our trips to Springfield, we try to take smaller trips uh, and we try to identify people who can, they, like their schedule will allow them to travel to Springfield. And so um, there's a lot of leaders that I talk to um, over a, a, a legislative session around just scheduling when they can and can't go. And so I'll know um, who to call and who not to call, um, depending on like, like where we are as far as our trips. Um, but that's one of the, if not, probably one of the biggest challenges um, that I've just, I've faced overall as an organizer and working with, with this population of people. Thanks, Marlon. Uh, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts, uh, Mich either Michelle or Glenn and or. Sure, this is Glenn. I'll jump in. Um, a couple of things. One, we're housed here in New York City, and our most ambitious campaign right now is the Close Rikers campaign. And so we have the most robust infrastructure of reentry and ATI programs of anywhere else in the country. And those organizations, Fortune Society, Osborne, Women's Prison Association, GOSO, uh, Center for Employment Opportunities. These are all supporters of the Close Rikers campaign, and that proximity helps us to refer uh, people who want to be part of our campaign but are facing housing and employment instability into those programs. As an organizer, I don't believe that you actually pay uh, your members or your leaders. I think it create, it changes the dynamic of the relationship, and when you run out of resources from philanthropy, you suddenly have a problem because you've created um, a skewed relationship with your members and leaders. I think that people, uh, you have people who are on staff who are directly impacted, and then you have people who are from the community, because the idea is you want to make sure when your nonprofit goes out of business, if it ever does, or if you shift gears, or if that grant is over, that you've built the capacity in the community for people to do the work, and that they're not reliant on you directly for resources to be able to do so. So we recognize the need to connect people to resources. We also don't engage people in advocacy work if they're not stable uh, and able to do so. If they're facing other forms of instability, a core part of work of an organizer is to help them to deal with those issues first before you pull them uh, towards the work. And this is Michelle, I'll just say very briefly, um, you know, one of the things that we've seen uh, organizations do um, has been to put together some kind of, uh, you know, uh, on the ground leadership institute where they may be doing um, uh, a paid uh, um, uh, fellowship uh, helping to 
uh, have the individual um, understand what the policy making process is, but understanding as well because of the financial concerns that it does have um, a paid component to it. And then you, you graduate from that and you have those skills and the ability to engage and to use those um, skills then to market yourself potentially, um, you know, to work at um, some of the nonprofit organizations that are engaged in this work. Um, so that's that's one model that's out there, but I would say I mean, it's, it's just just a really tough um, problem all around, whether it's in um, the space of reentry or just working with um, low-income folks um, and communities of color, immigrant communities, something that we face in all of our work, the very real um, uh, hard limitations that uh, working people have to be engaged in policy. Thank you all for sharing that, because I, I just really think that is a, a thing that we've, uh, an issue that we've run into. I mean, oftentimes folks that come home, um, you know, from, from prison often have many competing obligations. They have, they're a part of a program, they are working, and they have, you know, so it's really hard. And most of the lobbying and things that we do, it happens during the day and often for entire days. So, um, but I also want to just point out and highlight and lift up the people who, who actually do that in the midst of all of that stuff and just, to, to to really commend them, um, you know, for their tireless effort. I know people who have went to Springfield and come home to go do another job, you know, so working basically a 12 to 16 hour day, essentially. And I, I, I really want to, on the one hand, also, you know, really push us to think about how we can support people in these efforts but also too, man, to just really acknowledge that that the 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 spirit that they have and the the commitment to the work that they have, and I and I really wanted to just shout that out, um, really quick. Um, so we have, um, I, I think we have time for one more question. We have a few minutes left here, and this is directly directed at uh, Glenn. But I think um, you know any of us can probably. Uh, have some thoughts about this. Uh, Glenn, someone asked that, did the Khalif Browder case and documentaries raise awareness for closed Rikers? And can media attention be a good thing or a bad thing? That's a really good question. I tend to be the, the sort of uh, advocacy uh, person and organizing person who doesn't want to build uh, long-term campaigns around individual cases. So if people look at a lot of our messaging around the Close Rikers campaign, you'll find that one component, the speedy trial component, does focus on Khalif Browder's case because it was so inextricably tied to him being a detainee on Rikers for so many years and then ultimately having the charges dropped. And there are some people who are at Rikers for 10 years without being brought to trial. Um, at the same time, what I find, unfortunately, is that Americans and New Yorkers have uh, tension fatigue, if you will, around individual cases. And so trying to ensure that our campaign has the life cycle that it needs to get to the finish line, we very deliberately did not build a campaign around that specific case, especially as you look now, there's a new case, uh, Pedro Hernandez, that became a big case just a few weeks ago, written about in all of the newspapers, another person whose experience matched Khalif Browder's. I will say this, however, if you don't humanize the issue, then it becomes like everything else you watch on the evening news. If you look at how many people die in Syria and then people turn off the TV and say, oh, wow, that's tragic. Uh, that's how people have been handling Rikers Island in New York for the last few decades. And so I will say Khalif Browder's sacrifice uh, did help people to better understand the human toll and the human carnage that uh, emanates from Rikers Island. Um, I think we have about a one minute. Anybody else want to speak to the media being a good or a bad thing? Thanks, Glenn, for that. Um, I'll just say very quickly, um, for all of those that are in the audience that have the opportunity to engage the media, one of the things that um, I, I have found that's uh, and been inspired by the work that um, Glenn Martin um, has done and um, for folks like Daryl Atkinson and others, which is just to ensure that um, we pay attention to language. Language does shape our thinking and that the, the use of the language ex-offenders, ex-felon, um, any of that language is is not actually helpful to, to the cause and to really lead with language that's talking about and centers on people and that humanizing aspect. So I would encourage everybody that um, works with the media to pay attention to that and help educate um, the media so that it can be a better thing than, than, not, than not such a good thing. 
Thank you for that, bringing that up, Michelle. I mean, that is so important language, the type of language we use, and that's very consistent with what Glenn said is the humanizing uh, uh, folks, right? And, and part of the way we can, um, you know, uh, uh, lift up the humanity and dignity of people is in the, the language uh, that we use. So that's a really important point. So with that, um, uh, I want to thank the audience for uh, tuning in. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining the webinar today. Um, the webinar uh, recording and slides will be available um, on our uh, website. Um, and we'll also email them to you. Um, and via email, we'll try to answer uh, any questions that we didn't have time to address today. There were a few that, um, you know, we didn't get to, but we will reach out to you. I will personally make sure of it and uh, be able to answer your question if we did not um, get to it. But um, also, if you would like to um, get in touch with um, – Sorry, that's next steps. And then uh, any one of our speakers, those are the emails that uh, they provided. But also, um, you know, on each one of their slides, they had um, contact information um, as well. So, um, and here is our contact information for Heartland, as soon as I can advance this slide. Yep, there we go. Um, and uh, here's a slide with our contact information. So we hope you'll be uh, uh, keep in touch and you can follow us, email us, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. And uh, you can also learn more about our work at www.heartlandalliance.org slash national initiatives. And then um, please be on the lookout for our next webinar. Thank you, everyone. We really appreciate it.